you can go to James chapter 4. Um, tonight we'll focus on only verse 7 really, but of course we need the context of the, of the whole chapter because um, we don't preach things here out of context, so um, that's important. Let me read the the first in verses, starting in verse 1 of James chapter 4. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive, because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves to the Lord. Uh, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Let's look at this passage now. Let's pray first. Lord, we thank you for your word. Um, We thank you that as we we study James chapter 4 verse 7, where we have basically a a spiritual warfare in a nutshell, we do pray, Lord, that we would grow in our knowledge of you and um, we would cease from doing all these complicated and funny things and um, just do the simple things well. Please, Lord, be gracious and help us with regards to that. Amen. Not a lengthy introduction. Um... But this evening we'll conclude our series about spiritual warfare, where we studied um, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 to 20. I think that was about six sermons. Uh, 2 Corinthians 10, verse 1 to 6, which Colin did a few weeks back. And tonight we'll close with James chapter 4, verse 7. And we closed with this one specifically because it's spiritual warfare in a nutshell. If you had to put the whole series into one verse... um, in, into just a nutshell, this would be it. I don't really have ma- many more introductory comments, so I think let's just jump straight into the text. So let's go to, this is from James chapter 4, verse 7. Our first point will be therefore. Um, we're going to look at that section, therefore. Now, before we speak more generally about spiritual warfare, let's first see why James was writing this in James chapter 4, verse 7. Because what happened before this is relevant, especially since the word, therefore, is used. And if you have been in church long enough, you'll know the saying, when you see therefore, you must ask what it's there for. The presence of the word indicates that what was spoken about before will result in, in what will be spoken of afterwards. Or it may describe what the correct response is to what was discussed before, as is the case in this passage. It appears there was one major problem, according to James 4, verse 1 to 6, that James was addressing. And James chapter 4, verse 7 provides for us the biblical response to the problem. Let's quickly observe what this problem was by briefly studying James chapter 4, verse 1 to 6. It's a very brief overview of this. In verses 1 to 2 of James chapter 4, we see that there was a conflict between the Christians, or at least professing Christians, in the churches that James was writing to. This, the letter of James, 
wasn't written to a particular church, most likely, but rather a particular group of Christians scattered around the Roman Empire, most likely Jewish Christians. And if you want to see something to back that up, you just need to see James chapter 1, verse 1. And another section is in James chapter 5, verse 4. There, there's a word used, sabaoth. But in some translations, it might be translated Lord of hosts. And that's a, a, a word with a particular Jewish flavor to it. So um, this is a book with also a lot of Jewish sayings. So it was written most likely primarily to Jewish Christians. James told these professing believers that the source of their conflict they were having conflict, but the source of their conflict wasn't a desire to please God, but rather a desire to fulfill the lusts of their own hearts. And somebody else getting in the way of that. This led to the parties involved fighting each other, as opposed to running to the Lord for the solution in prayer. In verse 3, though, we see that some of those involved in this conflict, they did pray. But there was a problem with their prayers. Even though they prayed, they weren't praying for God's glory, but rather that they would have their lusts fulfilled. Warren Wearsby, probably my favorite commentator, illustrated this wonderfully when he described a woman who prayed for the salvation of her husband. Now that's a good thing. While recognizing that her motives were tainted because she prayed this from a desire to see him become a nicer person and to become easy, easier to live with, as opposed to wanting to see him serve Jesus or find deliverance from eternal damnation. In verse 4, we see James describe this mindset. What's the mindset? The selfish mindset. Why is there conflict? I want something. You're not giving it to me. Why am I praying? Because I want something and you're not, and it, you know, and it's for my selfish desires. He describes this mindset as worldliness. Worldliness isn't rap or punk rock music. Although some of the messages that come from such music can be worldly, but you can get that same message from all music. Probably some opera as well. But rather, worldliness is when we place our desires above the desires of God. Basically what happens when somebody worships themselves as opposed to God. In verse 5, we see that God didn't create us to worship ourselves, but he created us to worship him. And you know what? When we don't, he gets jealous with a righteous jealousy. When we worship anyone but him, just consider the first commandment in Exodus 20. Now, I remember back in the day, a poster at Ramah Church in Johannesburg, which was profound even though not many profound things came out of Ramah, I would drive past it on coming back from seminary, and I'd think, how can Ramah make such a profound statement? It read, worship something bigger than yourself. Worship something bigger than yourself. Showing that even Ramah, a church that often uh, preaches a lot of self-love, they can recognize self-worship. Worldliness tells us to put our desires first, when in reality, the, what the Bible teaches, we are to put God's desires first. In verse 6, James uses another word to describe this worldliness. What is that word? Pride. And we are told that God will oppose the proud and be gracious to the humble. Pride describes when someone has too high an estimation of themselves, or when someone thinks about themselves too much. See the word that keeps coming out? Self, self, self. 
This could describe the woman who's always referring to herself as a queen. This could describe the man who always thinks that he's the best at everything, the expert, or the person who's always going on about how bad they are, meaning they are still always thinking about themselves. They're still always thinking about how bad they are and secretly fishing for compliments. Now, I'm not the biggest fan of Tim Keller. I wasn't particularly impressed by his book, The Prodigal God. Can't say anything negative about it, but wasn't that impressed. But I did read something very profound from him once, and I recommend it. I actually might read it tomorrow morning. It's a short booklet. It's about 30 pages. It's fantastic. I, uh, it was lying on Barry's desk, and I said, can I have it? And he gave it to me. It's called The Freedom of Self-Forgetfulness. Now, in this booklet, at one point, Tim Keller speaks about how, how self-deprecating behavior can be as prideful as the person who thinks that they are the best. We are called to be self forgetful, not self deprecating. We as reformed believers can sometimes carry on about how sinful we are all the time. And you know what we are? We don't even realize how sinful we are. As bad as you think you are, you're worse. But you know what? Focusing on your sinfulness 24-7, as opposed to the person of Christ, can quickly become a very self-centered exercise we need to be aware of. So in summary, James 4 verse 1 to 6 is describing worldliness, self-worship, and a prideful heart to us, which are all ultimately the same thing. Just listen to this description of worldliness in 1 John 2 verse 16, and you'll see all these elements in it as we close off this section of the sermon. For all that is in the world, for all that is in the world, in other words, friendship with the world in the text we're looking at today, the desires of the flesh, what caused the conflicts? The desires of the flesh, the desires of our heart. And the desires of the eyes and the pride of life, which our text today, verse 6 of James chapter 4 says, which God opposes, the pride of life, is not from the Father, but where is it from? It's from the world. In James 4 verse 7, we will observe the solution to the problem. Let's just call this problem worldliness for the rest of the sermon. The source of the problem, we're going to take a look at that, and the promised outcome for every Christian that obeys the command given here in James 4 verse 7. Let's now continue studying James 4 verse 7 under our second heading, and this is also directly from the passage. Step one, submit yourselves to God. Submit yourselves to God. What's step one in spiritual warfare? Submitting ourselves to God. This no doubt describes a Christian, somebody that submits to Jesus. Someone who has Jesus as both their Savior because they have trusted Him to save them from their deserved punishment, and Lord because they now care more about what He desires than what they desire. Now, in the context of our series on spiritual warfare, two things need to be mentioned. Firstly, that a Christian can't be demon-possessed. A Christian can't be demon-possessed. Many Christians believe that it, it's possible for a Christian to be demon-possessed, which is clearly incorrect based on Matthew 12, Verse 28 to 29. You can go there now if you'd like. 
the Luke 11 passage, um, I decided to read it this morning just to compare the passages. And uh, in hindsight, I was like, oh, man, that passage is even better at explaining it. But it's the same passage, right? parallel passages. But go to Matthew 12, verse 28 to 29. Now, question before we read this. How can an evil spiritual force dwell and dominate the same domain as the Holy Spirit who despises sin and evil? Now, Jesus uses the illustration of a strong man representing, the strong man representing a demon or uh, the idea of the kingdom of Satan reigning. So Jesus uses the illustration of a strong man that was living in a house, representing the heart of a person, and in this case, a demon-possessed person. So a person with a demon within them, who was bound up, the strong man was bound up by a stronger man, Who's the stronger man? The stronger man is the Holy Spirit. Who, what does he do? He ushers in the kingdom of God. So that he can now do as he pleases in that house. Producing what? He produces righteousness as opposed to evil. Meaning that when the Holy Spirit takes residence in this house, in other words, lives within this believer, no weaker man's going to kick him out because the Holy Spirit is God with no limit to his power. And you know what? He is the strongest man. This is clear evidence that a Christian can't be demon-possessed because a demon can't wrestle power away from God himself. Today there are in, on Fortrecker Street, there are entire deliverance ministries dedicated to expelling the demon of lust, anger, alcoholism, or mental illness from Christians. And it's based on this idea that there's something living within them that can cause them to behave in a way that they don't want to. Now, there is something within us, Christians, that can make us do things we don't want to. But it's not a demon. And that's our sinful nature that is wrestling against the Holy Spirit. Just see Romans 7 and 8. The sad reality is that the people that attend these deliverance ministries, what they are saying is, it isn't me sinning, it's the demon inside of me. They're almost passing the buck. When they really need to humble themselves and say, I still have a sinful nature within me, and I need to beg the Lord to forgive me and to consistently strengthen me to overcome my own sinful desires at war with the Holy Spirit. It's not a demon against the Holy Spirit. It's your own sinful nature that the Holy Spirit is taking control of and, and, and getting rid of through the process of sanctification. You can have victory over Satan, but that requires you to take ownership of your sinful actions. Not blame them on a demon or say the devil made me do it. And I think back, whenever I hear that, I think of poor Hansi. We need to stop blaming, take ownership of our sin, and beg God to save us from our deserved judgment. If you've never taken ownership of your, of your sins, then you need to beg God to save you from judgment. I don't need to, and many here don't need to. They might need to say, Lord, please forgive me. But they don't need to say, save me from judgment. He already has. But if you have never taken ownership of your sin and you have never begged God to forgive you, you're in trouble. Listen to this rebuke 
from James chapter 1, verse 13 to 15, to people that were blaming their sin on God in this case. They weren't even blaming Satan. They were blaming God. They were saying, how can God make me do this? He made me like this. Listen to this. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tests tempts no one but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire then desire when it has conceived gives birth to sin and sin when it is fully grown brings forth death stop using god or the devil as an excuse for your sin or your circumstances and instead, according to James 4, verse 8 to 10, the verses that follow James chapter 4, verse 7, says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. This is what it looks like to submit to God. Draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and He will exalt you. Which clearly describes when somebody repents and trusts Jesus to save them. Now I said that there were two things that needed to be discussed under our discussion of submitting to God. And remember, this is in a larger context of the series and dealing with spiritual warfare. And the second thing is that expelling a demon from a non-Christian can be a very unkind thing to do unless they get saved. Why do I say that? Let's go a little further into Matthew chapter 12. And this is also in Luke chapter 11. And this is in the context of Jesus back and forth about uh, demon possession and, and um, the, the Pharisees claiming that he uses the power of Beelzebub to expel the demons. And then Jesus says, so if I use Beelzebub to expel demons, what do you use? Because you do it. So, in verses 43 to 45, we see Jesus, Jesus warns on the danger of having a demon cast out without the Holy Spirit coming to take residence in that person. And this is where the Luke 11 passage is maybe even a bit clearer. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest but finds none. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house empty, swept, and put in order. Then it goes and brings with it seven other spirits more evil than itself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. So also will it be with this evil generation. This is simple. If you ever encounter somebody that is demon-possessed, what a demon-possessed person needs more than anything else in the whole world is the gospel. They need the Holy Spirit to come and dwell within them and expel that demon. They need the gospel and they need faith in Jesus Christ. If they do not have that, you expel that demon, they're going to be in a worse position than where they started. Let's now move on to Step two in biblical spiritual warfare. And listen, I hope none of you ever get into a position like that. So, yeah, I haven't yet, and I hope I don't get there, but we'll see. Step two, resist the devil. Now, something very important is implied here. When you become a Christian and you submit yourself to God, satanic attack will follow. Many Christians seem to think, though, that when you become a Christian, Satan's just going to back off and leave you alone. Where here we see that the opposite's true. 
You have gone from being somebody that was doing everything Satan wanted you to, which is still the case if you worship yourself, to doing what he hates more than anything else, worshiping the being he despises most in all of existence. Do you think he's going to leave you alone? When you get saved, the following happens, as seen in Colossians 1 verse 13. He, speaking of the Father, has delivered us from the domain of darkness, Satan's domain, and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, Jesus. All non-Christians belong to Satan's domain. He is their father, according to John 8, 44. But when they get saved, what happens? They move over to God's kingdom. When that happens, the many schemes of the devil, according to Ephesians 6, 11, come into play. And that's why we need the whole armor of God to fight that battle. Now, we have discussed many of the ways Satan attacks in the series so far. But today, I'd like to address a worldview issue, a way of thinking about life directly related to worldliness, because that's the context of the passage. What has become very popular over the last 50 years or so is the self-esteem movement, which, with, with its many different manifestations, now, this could be a backlash from a time when people were maybe overly pessimistic or discouraging, which is also not good. But today it has become common for advertisers, psychologists, family members, etc., to say things like, you know what, you need to love yourself more. Or, you are a king or a queen. That man's not good enough for you or that woman's not good enough for you. You only deserve the best. We live in a world that wants us to think more highly of ourselves, not less highly. A world that wants us to worship ourselves. I often hear people describe others that they don't like as narcissists. I, I hear this a lot. And it may mean something very specific from a psychological perspective, but most people if you asked them, wouldn't be able to define what a narcissist is. What they mean, overwhelmingly most of the time, is that they think the person they don't like, they have an issue with, that this person is selfish. And their definition of selfish is when somebody refuses to give them what they want, which the accuser, which the accuser is often guilty when the accuser is actually more guilty sometimes as of the, of the sort, of, sort of turmoil and the back and forth and I want this and you're not giving it to me is that we see in James chapter 4 verse 1 to 2. Now, what is narcissism? Where does it come from? Narcissus is a character from Greek mythology that was in love with himself. And he killed himself because he couldn't physically be with himself because he was looking at his reflection in a river. A, a river nymph, he binge, was, he's so beautiful, he must look at himself in the river. So he stared at himself in the mirror, in the, not in the mirror, in the river. They didn't have mirrors back in those days. And he fell in love with himself and he looked at himself and he thought, sure, I'm beautiful. And he, he just wanted to be with himself, and he couldn't. All he could see was his reflection, and he killed himself. It's actually a very good illustration for the destructive nature of too much self-love. If we define narcissism as somebody that's in love with themselves, do you know what the sad reality is? Is that we'd have to admit that every person that walks this earth is a narcissist to a lesser or greater degree. And perhaps we should be less concerned about the narcissism in other people and more concerned with our own narcissism. I'm a narcissist. And everyone sitting in here is a narcissist. 
We all have too much love for ourselves. Satan wants you to love yourself more and to worship yourself. In Genesis 3 verse 5, we see Satan tempting Eve to sin with the lion. He doesn't go, worship me. He goes, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. You, knowing good and evil. If, you, if you'd like to watch a disturbing but very insightful documentary on the topic of music, it's a Christian documentary, but the nature of it being a music documentary, there's a slightly disturbing aspect to it because of the, the, the subject matter. Not because it's explicit. It's not explicit at all. It's a very good documentary, and it's well made, and it's made with good theology. Although it's not for children. It was made around 2004, and it's a bit outdated, although the biblical principles are very sound. It's a documentary called Hell's Bells 2. It's on YouTube, and it's about six hours long if you, you've got the time in your life to watch that. It's made by the same guys that made another very good documentary called Amazing Grace, A History and Theology of Calvinism, which is very good as well. It's, uh, so you, you get the idea. They, they, cons- they have a theology consistent with the theology of this church. Now, in this documentary, they examine the effects of music and its messages. And in the final portion of this documentary... They examine the message sent throughout the media for us to worship ourselves. In this portion of the documentary, they show a clip, actually a few clips, but one particular clip of a satanic priestess being interviewed. And the man asks this satanic priestess, if a Christian said to you that you are just really worshiping yourself, what would you say? For her to respond, In a sense, they would be right. It is a form of self-worship. And that's one of many similar claims. In this section, they argue that what is more dangerous than the man singing with devil horns is the pretty boy that you could take home to your mother, telling everybody to love themselves more and to follow their heart. The illustration they use in the documentary is the Marilyn Manson back in those days and the, the, the today Sam, whatever his name, I can't think, Sam, not Sam Harris, he's the atheist, but Sam Smith, who went on stage recently dressed as a devil. And everyone was asking, shocked by this at the recent Grammys. He was saying, they're not the dangerous people. Don't think they the dangerous people. They rat poison on a table. Some child's going to try and take it. If, they, if you put rat poison on a table in a room full of children, maybe one child will try and take it. But the reality is most won't. They know it's rat poison. The really dangerous thing is if you go into that room filled with children and you put M&Ms in the middle of the table, nice, sweet M&Ms, or smarties, and you lace them with a little bit of poison. That's going to kill more children than the rat poison. That's the illustration. And they say, Sam Smith and his devil horns, that's the rat poison. But the pretty boy that tells you to follow your heart, that's the M&Ms with a little bit of poison in it. Christians, beware of the messages bombarding you daily. Resist the devil on billboards, social media, advertisements from families, friends, strangers, shop windows, magazines. I can go on. You can't avoid it. It's there. Don't live your life naively believing everything the world tells you about life and try to take that and fit it into your Christianity. But rather beware of how much and what content you consume because it will affect you. And whatever you consume, including that nice Christian movie, ask whether it's consistent with what the Bible teaches. In other words, a biblical worldview. 
What will the effect of submitting to the Lord and resisting the devil be? Let's look at that now under our final heading and our conclusion. And he will flee from you. Here we are promised that if we are saved, which can't be separated from submission to God, and are seeking to resist Satan's attacks the whole, by wearing the whole armor of God and having a good biblical worldview to filter through all the messages that the world sends our way. Do you know what? We're going to be victorious. We can't stop Satan from attacking us. We can't. But in God's strength, we can resist his attack, attacks and he will flee. This is a promise from God's Word. Now, sadly, going back to the beginning of the series, and what prompted this is these, the, these uh, two young men that came and spoke to us and looked for help, these sleepless men that believed they were being tormented by demons. When we told them that the, this is the solution to their problem, that they could stand up to Satan's attacks, but only if they submitted to God, to Christ, which included them coming here to the church here, because they weren't a part of the church. We told them, come here, be a part of us. You need to be with other Christians. You can't fight this battle alone. Do you know what they did? They were scared. They were running scared. And my heart breaks for these guys. They chose to keep hiding and running from Satan. Often saying that the attacks grew more intense when they actually came here. When we told them, it made sense that Satan attacks more aggressively when you're doing the right thing using this text. Because they only attacks when we do the right things. They actually became discouraged. They didn't come to us to hear that they needed to fight, but we were hoping that they could sit by passively while we fought on their behalf. They were looking for us to do a quick exorcism, a deliverance ministry. That's why they phoned. And even when we said to them that the Bible promises victory to those who resist, they wouldn't believe it. If anyone can relate to these two men, or even if these two men are perhaps listening online, I told them about the series, and I still care for them very much. Please stop running away and hiding, and instead run to the cross, to God's community, even if Satan attacks you for this, and continue to obey God's word, even when it hurts. And please be motivated by the promise that God will make Satan flee. If you continue to resist, let's pray. Lord, we just want to thank you that spiritual warfare really isn't that complicated. We just need a relationship with you. We know that the enemy will come after us, but our big brother is bigger than he is. And we can resist him. And then, Lord, he will eventually flee. Please be gracious. Please help people to read these kind of texts. To believe them. To believe the promises of God. Please save many who are feeling tormented and um, haven't turned to you for the salvation of their soul. Please, Lord, be gracious to them. Please. Um, cause many, Lord, who are guilty of worshipping themselves and um, cause them to repent of that and to turn to you. Please be gracious, Lord. Um, you can do these things. And, um, oh, Lord, please help us as believers to grow in our knowledge of you on a daily basis so that even when Satan attacks us with these worldly ideas on a daily basis that we would not succumb to them. Please be gracious. Amen. Um...